from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editorial Director, and today we're going to be talking about conflict in the South Caucasus and the role of Russia, Turkey, and Iran. In mid-July, fighting flared up between Azerbaijan and Armenia along their northern border, resulting in more than 15 deaths. The two countries have been involved in one of the world's longest-running conflicts for more than three decades now, over the region of Nagorno-Karabakh, an ethno-territorial dispute that dates back to the end of the Soviet Union. As the major regional actors, Russia, Turkey, and Iran all have interests in the geostrategically important South Caucasus, as well as varying ties with Azerbaijan and Armenia. To discuss the situation, we're joined today by three great guests, Thomas Naval, Nicole Grzewski, and Theodore Karasik. Tom is a senior fellow with Carnegie Europe, specializing in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus. He's the author of numerous publications about the region, including The Caucasus in Introduction, Great Catastrophe, Armenians and Turks in the Shadow of Genocide, and Black Garden, Armenia and Azerbaijan Through Peace and War. Nicole's a doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford in the Department of Politics and International Relations, where her research examines Russian and Iranian perspectives on international order. Ted is a fellow on Russian and Middle Eastern Affairs at the Jamestown Foundation. He's also currently a senior advisor to Gulf State Analytics and an adjunct senior fellow at the Lexington Institute. Tom, Nicole, Ted, thank you all for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Glad to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Tom, let's start with you. For our listeners who might not have followed last month's developments closely, can you tell us in brief what happened and how it fits into the broader context of the Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict? Well, you need long memories to uh, look into this conflict um, all the way back to 1988 and the era of perestroika, Mikhail Gorbachev. When this broke out, it was the first ethno-territorial conflict in the Soviet Union since the 1920s. And basically, much has changed, but the central issue, which is uh, a dispute over the autonomous territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, which had an Armenian majority population, but was inside Soviet Azerbaijan, that essential dispute remains the same. First, it was inside the Soviet Union. Uh, When the Soviet Union ended, it became a conflict between two new nation states. The Armenians won that war, basically, in 1994. A ceasefire was declared, but obviously Azerbaijan has not accepted the loss of its territory. And in recent years, uh, the conflict has morphed again in the sense that both sides have armed Azerbaijan, has used a lot of its oil and gas revenues to build up a much bigger military potential. But very little has changed on the ground. We saw a big flare up in 2016 when about 200 people died. We then saw a bit of a thaw in 2018 with the change of regime in Armenia, peaceful revolution in Armenia, and a kind of resumption of of high level contacts between the two sides. But the optics were good, um, some of the messaging was good, but nothing, there was no real political substance to the talk. So I'm afraid what we saw last month was a kind of re-worsening, if I could put it like that, of the situation and a flare-up of the the ceasefire breaking down, a flare-up of fighting. And in this strategically sensitive point on the border between the two countries where there are a lot of villages, concentration of heavy weaponry, so a place where a minor escalation can get particularly bad quite quickly. Uh, And because political uh, relations were deteriorating between the two sides, I think there was a decision not to de-escalate, but to fight it out for a few days. Tom, as you mentioned, unlike in previous clashes, the fighting this time around was in the north near the border with Georgia. Why was that? And what potential ramifications could it have had for regional energy and, and transport infrastructure? These two countries share two quite long borders. Uh, one in the north, one in the south. And in the middle, there's the ceasefire line, the so-called line of contact running across uh, Azerbaijani territory, which is where the fighting stopped in 1994. Uh, Pretty much any of those points, if relations are in a a bad state, the two sides can can break the ceasefire and start start taking potshots at one another. Uh, This point is particularly sensitive uh, because the border is, is very complicated, There are several villages here and quite a high concentration of 
military equipment. And of course, the two sides are much better equipped in arms than they ever were in the 1990s. Is there a wider regional implication to this? Well, not immediately, but the oil and gas pipelines, um, which run from the Caspian through Azerbaijan and Georgia to Turkey, run just to the north. And Georgia is is just to the north. So, so it's not just the wider international community that's interested in dampening something like this down. It's also anyone interested in oil and gas and, and Georgia as well. Nicole, shifting gears, I want to turn next to where the major regional actors stand in all of this, starting with Russia. Moscow has strong relations with both Baku and Yerevan and sells both of them arms, while also maintaining a military base in Armenia. How does Russia balance its ties with the two countries, and what was its response to the recent flare-up? Well, Russia's reaction to the recent flare-up was consistent with its overall balancing policy of managing and controlling the instability between Armenia and Azerbaijan by using various political, economic, and military levers to assert its influence over the two conflicting parties. Um, At the same time, Russia has also prioritized the stability of the conflict and has sought to prevent it from spilling over potentially into um, a wider regional conflict with Turkey or Iran. In the recent flare-up, Russia stayed relatively neutral, uh, despite the fact that Armenia is a key Russian ally and also a member of the Russian-led Collective Treaty Security Organization. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov called both the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers and also brokered a telephone conversation between them. However, much to Armenia's dismay, the Collective Treaty Security Organization came out with a statement that was rather even-handed that sought to kind of strike a balance between both the Armenian and the Azerbaijani positions and did not come out and suggest that they had any grounds to intervene or to support the Armenian call for defense. In general, uh, with the Russia-Armenia, Russia-Azerbaijan relationship, it's developed and changed a bit over time. Uh, Initially, Russia was far more closely bound to its relationship with Armenia until around the 2000s with the Putin administration and kind of the rapprochement between Armenia and Russia. Russia does provide uh, weapons to Armenia at a discounted price pursuant to the Collective uh, Security Treaty Organization. And also with Azerbaijan, Russia is the leading um, arms provider for uh, Baku. So in many ways, Russia uses this as an incentive for both countries to maintain relations with Russia, but also occasionally will use this as a way to bring them both to the table, as we saw in 2016 with the four-day war. So in general, it's a a very complex policy. It's very different than um, what you see with Georgia or even with Ukraine. And I think in general, Russia views itself as kind of this power with privileged interests, um, so much so more than any of the other um, Minsk co-chairs and also more important than Turkey as well. Turkey's uh, another major regional actor with a lot at stake here. It has close economic and security ties to Azerbaijan, but no diplomatic relations with Armenia. Ankara noticeably ratcheted up its rhetoric this time around, with the Turkish defense minister going so far as to say Yerevan would pay for the recent escalation. What's driving Ankara's more aggressive posture? Turkey's aggressive posture right now is driven by the desire to show Ankara as a regional power, and particularly so in regards to what's happening in the Mediterranean and in Libya itself. Uh, This blue homeland doctrine for maritime security, of course, is not in the Caucasus, it's in the Mediterranean, but those transit lines enter and exit through the Mediterranean. So it's very important to look at Turkey's larger strategic picture and how it sees itself in the region and particularly with Armenia and Azerbaijan. The outbreak of hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan from Turkey's point of view was seen as a provocation in order to divert Turkey's attention away from Libya and its ongoing operations there. And I think that there's a pretty good argument to be made that the Uh, escalation of the violence occurred two days after 
President Erdogan declared Hagia Sophia a grand mosque. And uh, there are other players in and around the region that want to take advantage of that notification. And because of that, uh, this outbreak of violence occurred. So what we're looking at here is typically historical in the sense that uh, the Caucasus are the crossroads of empire. And there are various empires trying to influence the outcome of Armenia and Azerbaijan, and particularly of how Turkey sees itself in the region. So I think the takeaway here really about Turkey's foreign policy towards the Caucasus and this event needs to be taken in a more uh, wide view about where Turkey is pursuing its foreign policy and security interests today and how a flare up of a, if you will, a frozen conflict by unfreezing it, what does that do to the Turkey's calculus? Following up on that, Ted, what impact is Turkey's more aggressive foreign policy stance likely to have on relations between Armenia and Russia? Do you think it, it could end up pushing Yerevan closer toward Moscow? Yerevan uh, is considered already a proxy of Russia in the overall historical uh, arc. And so I think it's safe to assume if you will, that Armenia and Russia are coordinating together. They do share a lot of security concerns and equipment. Uh, Serbia, of course, is also involved in Armenia and helping to arm Armenia, and that played a role in this recent conflict. Uh, Russia does not have the same type of relationship with Azerbaijan, uh, because of the uh, way that Aliyev has governed the role of his wife now as a power player in Azerbaijan itself. So Russia is looking at both Armenia and Azerbaijan about how to play them off of each other at the same time that Turkey's looking at Russia to see how Moscow will play that Armenian card now. But it appears to me uh, currently that the pressure's really on Azerbaijan and not Armenia uh, from Russia's point of view. Russia's trying to extract something out of Azerbaijan, uh, which is tied to the energy industry. The other major regional actor here, of course, is, is Iran. Traditionally, Tehran's been officially neutral in the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute what was Tehran's response to the July fighting, and, and where does it stand vis-a-vis -vis Yerevan and, and Baku more broadly? Well, Iran's response was actually quite similar to Russia's. Iran uh, declared that it was neutral in the conflict and that it wanted both sides to show restraint and to um, resolve the disputes through mediation. I would say that this is very consistent with the way that Iran has approached the conflict since the 1990s. If you recall that in 1992, Iran actually brokered uh, several ceasefires between Armenia and Azerbaijan and hosted a summit between the two presidents in um, Tehran. Additionally, Nagorno-Karabakh is quite close to Iranian security calculations, especially along its northern border. This was definitely the case in the 1990s when the Karabakh War actually reached the Iranian-Azerbaijani border and Iran had to mobilize troops as well as elicit major refugee relief programs. In general, Iran also has a difficult balance in many ways between its more normative perspectives about separatism and restive regions with minority populations. And so we, we, you see with the Karabakh issue that Iran has actually supported the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan and stated that you, it seeks no goals in interfering in that sense. However, at the same time, Iran has also developed quite close relations with Armenia, and that um, links back to the 1990s as well. More recently, Iranian and Azerbaijani relations have improved, especially under Rouhani. Prior to this, there was significant tension, especially under the Ahmadinejad administration. But with Rouhani, you see a gradual improvement, especially in terms of economic ventures. Um, Azerbaijan and I Iran have been spending more time um, upgrading the north-south transit corridor. And also in terms of the Caspian Sea delimination, there have been somewhat uh, measured improvements in that regard. 
though uh, there are still outstanding differences over the seabed um, delimination. So currently, Iran does have and does enjoy um, somewhat cordial relations with Azerbaijan, whereas with Armenia, Iran has had far more um, consistent and uh, positive relations. And, and this was shown during Bolton's visit to uh, the, the South Caucasus, where Pashayan said that Armenia will maintain its relationship with Iran and that Iran is an important and economic partner for Oz- and for Armenia. So I think that's important to note um, that even with this maximum pressure campaign, Armenia has been essentially exempt by secondary sa- sanctions on um, trade. So um, yeah, in general, I think Iran also doesn't view the South Caucasus as its priority, though increasingly you see more of an emphasis on this, partly because of its relationship with Russia, but also to diversify its relations with other states beyond the Middle East. Nicole, Azerbaijan has had close relations with Israel for decades, including in the security and defense sphere. How does that affect Tehran's perception of Baku and kind of strategic calculus? Well, initially, the Iranian reaction to Azerbaijan's outreach to Israel in the 2000s was quite hostile. The domestic media really took this up and portrayed it as Azerbaijan um, permitting Israel to use um, Azerbaijani territory to launch attacks on Iranian weapons sites, also on Iranian nuclear facilities. More recently, actually early July, there was rumors in the Iranian press that Israel launched a drone from Azerbaijani territory to spy on Iranian nuclear installations. This is something that has been recurrent in the Iranian domestic discourse. However, with the improvement of Iranian Azerbaijani relations, there has been more nuance coming into popular understandings of the relationship between Azerbaijan and Israel. Um, in particular, I, w- from what I've observed is that Iran has noted that in many ways the Israel-Azerbaijan relationship is not only related to Iran and does reflect Azerbaijani needs to um, diversify its defense industry and also um, over the need to receive modernized equipment for um, Nagorno-Karabakh. So in many ways, I think that you can look at it from more of the hardline perspective, which would say that, you know, Israel and Azerbaijan are, you know, hostile towards Iran. This is for intelligence gathering, for potentially launching attacks on Iran. But really the more moderate and kind of uh, pragmatic strand in the Iranian domestic debate is that Azerbaijan does not seek to um, attack Iran and that Azerbaijan may maintain close relations with Israel, but it's not to the detriment of Iran. And I believe that Azerbaijan is also mindful that Iran could potentially target its oil and gas pipelines in any kind of escalation uh, with Israel or with the West. So that is also something that um, is apparent. And we saw that in 2008 with Georgia. So I wouldn't completely rule that out either. Ted, the Russia-Turkey bilateral relationship is a complex one. They have a strong economic relationship and increasingly close defense ties, but they've also found themselves at odds on the foreign policy front in Syria and more recently in Libya as well. How does the the South Caucasus fit into the the context of that broader dynamic? What I see uh, occurring across the region in terms of Turkish-Russian relations is not quite a division of labor. It's more of a negotiation about how best to proceed in a region uh, in a fight uh, with two sides and trying to uh, gain leverage over the other. I don't really see them in partnership per se and trying to solve issues as much as they are uh, trying to uh, move forward with uh, how they see that country's uh, future, like for Libya. When we're looking at Libya now, these two sides are beginning to look at how best to divide or partition Libya. Uh, So that is where their interaction lies on that. When it comes to the issue of the Caucasus, their interaction is going to be a bit different because the Caucasus is a different animal, if you will, because of its history and location. And for Turkey, I think we need to pay attention to how Turkey is reaching out to Central Asia and so on. And what Russia thinks about
about Turkey's entry, uh, re-entry, multiple entries into Central Asia and how that undermines Russian security within the former Soviet space. The same issue is true for the Caucasus. This region now is going through an upheaval, a shift in the way that the Armenia and Azerbaijan sit between Turkey and Russia. So there is a move on going to restructure that relationship that might see Russia and Turkey on opposite sides. And that will be important to watch for because that will have a ripple effect in the other areas where they're trying to negotiate in Syria and in Libya itself. So these three are actually all connected together, Libya, Syria and Armenia, Azerbaijan. Nicole, Russia and Iran have close ties in general, but how do they balance their competing interests in areas like the economy, security and energy in the South Caucasus? Well, in the South Caucasus, Russia and Iran have displayed quite a bit of congruency on certain issues pertaining to security. Initially, Russia feared that Iran would try to um, assert greater influence in the South Caucasus, potentially disrupt uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. But by the mid-1990s, there seemed to be an implicit understanding between the two countries of the limits of Iranian aspirations and also the parameters of cooperation. I would say that Iranian recognition of Chechnya as an internal affair for Russia really did influence its view of Iran in the South Caucasus. So in terms of the security sphere, Russia and Iran do have a a bit more congruence, I would say, than looking in the economics or the energy sphere, especially when it comes to the Caspian Sea. And the Caspian Sea has been the primary area of tension between the two countries. Earlier on, in the um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they, they did share a common view on the delimination of the seabed and the subsoil. Though by the mid-2000s, Russia's um, bilateral agreements and with uh, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan deeply upset Iran, and that was a huge point of tension, especially during the Khatami administration. I would say that in the current context, especially with the Caspian Sea Agreement, there's been more of an emphasis on linking up the transport and energy corridors between Russia and Iran. Um, the North-South Transport Corridor, which is an agreement that originally happened in the 2000s with Russia, India, and Iran, which has now expanded to states such as Azerbaijan and many of the Central Asian states, that envisions Iran as a kind of a conduit between the South Caucasus, Eurasia, and the Persian Gulf. So Russia's Caspian development strategy actually reflects this. So in some ways, it's, a lot of this is discursive, and, and the actual tangible manifestations of this has yet to be completely realized, though Russia has sought to kind of strike somewhat of a better policy when it comes to the economic aspect that kind of belies the former tensions around potential energy exports. Additionally, I would um, note that with the Caspian Sea and in general with the South Caucasus, Russia and Iran have both displayed quite a bit of apprehension towards the construction of the Trans-Caspian pipeline and have effectively sought to uh, prevent that. And this was actually included, the the environmental clause that was included in the Caspian, the 2008 Caspian Declaration or Agreement, actually um, was really pushed by Russia and Iran to kind of invoke this as a way of preventing Turkmenistan or Azerbaijan or any of Kazakhstan from developing pipelines um, in the Caspian. And they also managed to include perhaps one of the most salient um, areas of agreement, which is preventing the role of non-regional forces um, in the Caspian Sea. So in many ways, this is a complex mosaic of, you know, converging interests and diverging interests. But out of all the areas of Russia and Iranian interaction, I would say the South Caucasus is is, uh, far less problematic than, for example, um, what we're seeing in uh, post-war Syria. Tom, the Armenia-Azerbaijan issue hardly seems to be on the radar here in Washington. I'm curious, are things any better in Brussels? And what more should the U.S. and the EU be doing here? I think that's probably because of uh, fatigue about this conflict. Um, Periodically, it does register on the radar, both in the U.S. uh, and in Europe. Um, The three mediators, the so-called uh, co-chairs of the Minsk Group are Russia, the US, and France. And through the years, obviously, Russia has been the most seriously involved third 
Third State. Um, Russian Minister, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is, is very closely involved in the negotiations. The U.S. has periodically taken an interest. It convened the Key West meeting back in 2001, which Colin Powell, um, who was then Secretary of State, attended. Various French leaders have occasionally taken an interest, including Jacques Chirac. Um, but I guess, you know, it, inevitably, it's a, a long-running conflict. It's, I guess, the only competitor in Europe um, is Cyprus. And like Cyprus, you know, mediators come and go. Um, and I think the view is very much that this won't be solved by geopolitical action. It will be basically solved by the parties to the conflict themselves uh, who can be nudged um, and the situation can be managed. And if there's an escalation, there can be diplomatic interventions to try and calm it down. But I think the only third party which has sees a clear strategic interest in this conflict uh, is Russia. And even Russia, to be honest, uh, I think has more immediate concerns, whether it be Syria or Ukraine or, or now, uh, obviously, Belarus. Tom, so fighting along the border has died down for now, but the underlying issue driving the conflict remains alive and well. Where do you see things going from here? I don't see any good outcomes in, in the short term. It's all about um, managing the ceasefire. It's about appealing to the rational goodwill of, of, of both sides that they don't want to further escalation. And that's about it, unfortunately. Um, there was obviously an uptick in interest in 2018 with the coming to power of a new government in Armenia, a much more uh, a government with much greater democratic legitimacy. But I think it was a bit naive, as many in Azerbaijan thought at the time, that this would involve a major re Armen Armenian rethink on the conflict. Um, basically, the new leadership in, in Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, has pretty much the same strategic interest in keeping the gain, territorial gains of the conflict on board as much as possible and you know, negotiating, as they see it, from a position of strength. So I think we then get into this unfortunate dynamic that Azerbaijan, which was the loser of the conflict in the 1990s, only really has one good weapon of leverage, and that is to threaten or to occasionally use military force. And this is why the conflict is mostly quiet for most of the time, but then we get these periodic flare-ups on, on, on the ceasefire line. Ted, when it comes to the South Caucasus and the key regional actors involved there, what will you be keeping a close eye on in the coming weeks and months? What's important to watch as this uh, conflict uh, simmers and perhaps heats up again is how outside actors are using this conflict to distract Turkey. The question becomes, can these actors distract Turkey, let's say, from Libya or Syria by igniting something in the Caucasus. Uh, this is something to watch for. I would also be watching for how third parties are looking at Armenia as a Christian state, uh, one that is uh, uh, focused on uh, the ills of genocide and so on. Uh, there's a move within the region, Middle East, uh, Europe, and so on, uh, to be looking more at the issues of genocide uh, as part of a soft power policy push uh, in order to uh, create new uh, opportunities that are related to Israel and the Palestinian conflict. And so this will all be tied together. So it's important to watch how uh, the Armenian church, for example, or how Azerbaijan is portrayed in religious terms as uh, we move forward. I think this is very important to watch for because the uh, region is transforming currently from uh, what was an old order to a new order with COVID-19 uh, being a main driver of geopolitics and geoeconomics. So this is a third factor, is watching the how these countries are interacting with other partners over 
COVID-19 treatment uh, programs. Nicole, you've got the last word. Any final thoughts? Um, In the future, I I would look at kind of the dynamics of the Russia-Iran relationship more generally and see how this translates into the caucuses, uh, whether or not many of these transport and infrastructure projects are actually realized, uh, especially in light of U.S. sanctions. Moreover, uh, with a perhaps different U.S. presidential administration, whether or not um, there will be some kind of uh, shift in tension um, between Russia and Iran over um, competing energy projects. With Iranian policy, I would say that, especially with Azerbaijan, there seems to be a continued emphasis on maintaining this relationship. And this is demonstrated by uh, the recent employment of the former foreign ministry spokesman, Saeed Abbas Musavi, as ambassador to Baku, which I believe underscores the importance of the iran Azerbaijan relationship moving forward. We'll have to leave things there for today. But Tom, Nicole, Ted, thank you all for joining the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.